Hey, everybody, just another reminder, the following version of this episode is spoiler ridden. We're talking Star Wars. I don't want to spoil it for you guys if you do not want to have it spoiled. If you've already seen the movie and that's the only way I want to, you know what? Don't even be that kind of person who's like, oh, I don't care if I don't see the movie. I just see like, you know, go ahead. Tell me what happens. I hate that. It drives me nuts. So go see the movie, then listen to this episode. If you've not listened to this episode, listen to our regular coming attractions episode. We talk very vaguely about the movie. Uh, and then we talk about other things. We deal with other stuff. So on with the show. You're listening to miscast commentary. Hey everybody, welcome to Cast Commentary. I am Joe Finley. Todd Tebow the Sailor Murray is missing because I just got home from seeing Star Wars Episode Nine: The Rise of Skywalker. And we had such a fun time We see in that movie. I didn't see it with Todd. I don't believe he saw it tonight. I think he's seeing it this weekend. I'm not entirely sure. But, man, so much going on in this movie. It was hard-hitting super fast paced i would say especially that first hour was just non stop such a different pace from any other star wars movie to just be like diving in and out of everybody's stories to start with that awesome battle scene with kylo ren just like rage hunting for the emperor and finding him and just how creepy he looked like the design on him was so fantastic. And Ian McDiarmid, man, just all the credit in the world to him. I don't think he gets enough credit for how good he is and even was in the prequels. He is fantastic in the prequels and he is fantastic in this episode. And man, just so good. And it was such a way to start this off and then to have Ray training as a Jedi kind of Luke with Yoda style, but a little bit more advanced uh, with Leia as the master. And that was a wonderful moment. And I still have a hard time even understanding how they got the footage that they got. Uh, most of it is, of course, uh, actually footage from The Force Awakens and The Last Jedi. But what's interesting is that obviously they didn't like, I don't believe these were deleted scenes or anything like that. So, like, to work in the storyline of the Jedi training and all the things that were going on in this movie is really astounding. Uh, there were a couple of spots where I assumed I was looking at some random footage that they just happened to have where it would be, you know, some third party would come up and say something to her and she'd be looking off and then she'd say something that was generic enough that it wasn't specific to the scene or anything like that. But hey, these things happen. They did a really good job uh, keeping her in the movie. And of course, to a huge end, I really wish, I mean, for obvious reasons, I really wish she would have been alive to be in this movie. She was, of course, supposed to be the central of the originals in this one, you know how they, how Han Solo was kind of the main in the first one, then it was Luke in the second one, and this was supposed to be Leia's movie. And it's sad that all we got is what we got, you know what I mean? But it's amazing that they were able to even put that together, and good for them uh, for doing it and for honoring her, I believe, in such a wonderful way. Her ending... Again, spoiler alerts, guys. Her ending, uh, dying, just reaching out that last time to Kylo Ren, a.k.a. Ben Solo, uh, was just heartbreaking. And just that moment uh, between Ray and Ben was, oh, it was just fantastic. It was the most acting that Adam Driver has really been allowed to do. Uh, you know, don't get me wrong, he's been acting, but it's that was just a really fun and powerful moment for the two of them. And I was really, really happy with how they dealt with that. Uh, so many other things to talk about in this movie is so we've, we've established the emperor. Everybody knows about the emperor. So uh, there was no real way to make it a good surprise, I guess. I think it had to be a part of the trailer and all that kind of stuff. Cause I was, I remember when I watched the trailers, I was like, Oh man, that's something I really would have liked to have, saved and been surprised about but it really is kind of a central piece in this i don't know if maybe 
they could have thought to do like some kind of something at the end of The Last Jedi or even a post credit sequence would have been cool. I know they don't do that as kind of a regular, but that would have been an interesting idea. And, but yeah, they really, the way they worked him in. Uh, one thing that bums me out, and this is, a lot of this has to do with uh, legends and uh, the rights to naming and all these different things, but it's just the little names that I would have loved to have seen as a Star Wars fan, uh, which kind of bummed me out. Like, not in a complaining kind of way, but just in a, oh, that would have been really cool to hear him say it. Uh, in the radio plays and other versions of the story where that continued and the Emperor was indeed back, uh, which would have been... I guess the original episodes seven, eight, and nine, he comes back, you find out he has had clones and all these things going on uh, in the background the entire time, and he keeps going into his clones, and uh, then there's another big war, and then he kills, they destroy the place where all the clones are, and then he comes back again, and it's like, oh, but we destroyed all your clones, and he goes, not all my clones, and it's just like, oh, okay, so that's just a thing, and we'll deal with it, but in those versions... Uh, there is a planet called Bis, which is kind of like the center of the galaxy, which is kind of the place you would expect an emperor to set up shop. And uh, that would have been cool to have heard that name. Or I thought, actually, the name I thought I was going to hear was Korriban. And people who don't know Korriban, uh, it is in the Knights of the Old Republic series and all that. It is actually the place where the Sith trained. It is the place where the Sith, uh, the Sith tombs are and all these different things. And I thought that's what we were looking at. When you go down into the thing, there's all those large statues and stuff like that. And so essentially that's what it was. And I think it's just really a naming rights of, I can't take the name from this book because we made the book not canon, blah, 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 blah. Uh, so I'm fine with doing whatever they did with it with as far as the names, but it would have just been cool to have heard that. Uh, the other thing that I would have liked too is when they, with the Sith Wayfinder, uh, that was not a, not a name for a thing I would have liked. Like I was like going woohoo about, but I would have loved for that to have been able to be the Holocron, for example. I think that would have been cool. I think the Holocron if I'm not mistaken, they have made their way into canon as well. I think that would have been a really cool way of, instead of like something you hook into so you can fly, would have been the finding the location and how to get to it. Uh, could have been like contained in the holocron as something that would be passed from Sith to Sith. That would have been pretty neat. But again, these are very, very small complaints. That's literally just like, a fanboy just reaching out for a few extra Easter eggs. Uh, the relationship between Rey and Kylo Ren uh, continues with their connection in the Force, and you find out that Snoke was indeed a creation of the Emperor. Uh, I don't know if that was just a way to kind of dismiss him or if it was a way to better tie up why Snoke was a thing. Uh, either way, they that's how they went about doing it, which means that the connections that were occurring between the two of them uh, had a lot more to do with not just Palpatine, but with their connection, uh, which they delve into in this movie as well. So let's talk about that connection. They are... Okay, like once again, spoiler alerts. We have the grandson of Anakin Skywalker and the granddaughter of Emperor Palpatine. And this was something that was a lot of people guessed or had some guess around it. It's got something to do with Pal Palpatine. It's the daughter. It's this. It's that. And it was cool. I was down with it. I think that her fear of what was next because of that uh, was a great running point in the movie. The visions she was having uh, were cool like that, and you got to see that double lightsaber evil ray, uh, and you even got to see them square off in that kind of 
a strong in the dark side cavern in the Death Star there, which was cool. And yeah, so and we pretty early on establish more of them being able to connect physically to each other uh, through the Force without having to be in the same space. They were they had a lightsaber fight. They took uh, Kylo Ren took a necklace from Rey. Uh, and all these things, which of course leads up to the wonderful moment at the end, which we'll get to briefly. Uh, but yeah, so that was a lot of uh, good foreshadowing for for that great moment. And we start getting into Poe Dameron's background a little bit more. We find out that he was a little bit of a uh, bad boy in his past. He was a spice runner, a uh, little, little bit of Han Solo in him, doing some bad, some naughty stuff, as it were. And you meet his, for lack of a better way to put it, love interest, uh, played by Carrie Russell, who wears a mask the entire time, except she uncovers her eyes just briefly. But, uh, yep, Felicity made this way into a J.J. Abrams joint. And she was good in it, and she's not in it for a very long time. And this is kind of what I was getting at. Uh, one of my complaints, not not even a complaint again, but it was just one of my thoughts about the movie. They introduce a lot of characters who have very small parts. And I mean, her part is not teeny tiny, but it's small overall. Uh, and there's other ones as well. There's the uh, the other stormtroopers who deserted uh, that Finn finds. And that was cool. But yeah, they're just, again, there's just these small parts that I don't know if they could have combined a couple or just this, because I know another complaint about the movie was just you're meeting a lot of characters, you're doing a lot of stuff, there's a lot of exposition, and it was it was a very go, go, go movie, but it goes really fast. I didn't even realize how late it was when the movie was finished, and it was just like, wow, it really kind of like just put the pedal to the metal and kept it down. Uh, but yeah, so you find out as they're trying to uh, get some Sith information that is uh, buried deep in 3PO's brain thanks to uh, a dagger that he that he translated the inscription from. Uh, and he obviously, well, not obviously, but he can't say the words, so they actually had to wipe his brain. So to allow him to actually translate the information, uh, that was... Yeah, that was cool. That was an interesting little plot point. And then to have to see all the raids going on and to have them have this little kind of cloak and dagger moment. And then the uh, introduction of the teeny tiny little bubble freak. Now, he was another adorable little character. And that is a thing about this movie. A lot of humor in this movie. I think they handled it quite well. I don't think it was too much. That's at least my thoughts on it. Uh, it was... It had the charm that I think the originals had that I don't think any of the prequels or uh, either of the two of this trilogy had. And that's not to disparage the movies in any way. It's just to say that there was one thing that they weren't doing as much or they weren't doing as well, maybe. Uh, because I know there was some, like, you know, there was humor in all of them. Uh, there were spots in The Force Awakens where there were attempts at humor. I was just kind of like, eh, but fine, okay, go ahead. But I don't know. This one, I think that the chemistry of everybody and the way they were used and the way they decided to insert the humor was just so much better in this one than any of the others. And that had a lot to do with uh, giving the main three, your uh, Ray, Fo, <laughs> Ray, Poe, and Finn, give them more scenes together, which we haven't, they've spent most of their trilogy really apart. And to bring Anthony Daniels in a big way back into this movie, because he was such a small part, really, in the last ones. And... It was fantastic. He was so good in this one. He get getting his memory wiped and just having that whole everything's the first kind of moment. They didn't overdo it. I was really getting worried that he was going to have his mind wiped for the rest of the movie. So everything was going to be, wow, this is the first, this is the first, this is the first. But they give you just enough of that before you get R2 to kind of give him a, uh, 
a, re, a you know a mind a memory restore, and then you kind of get back into it. And but I think that Anthony Daniels, who has been the only cast member who's in every single Star Wars movie, remember that guys. Yeah, he did such a great job in this one, and he should be very proud of how he got to contribute to this one, for sure. We'll talk a little bit about the reasonably well kept secret of. Uh, the Death Star being located on Endor, or on one of the moons of Endor, not the wall, not the forest moon, but one of the other ones, uh, which makes sense because originally, uh, when you read, or when you were reading up on it, I think they kind of denied that it had anything to do with Endor, and then you're like, well, how did the Death Star get all the way to some other planet or something like that? Uh, yes, this one did indeed. When it blew up, it did go down, and it landed on one of the other moons, which was a not a completely water-based planet, but a very violent water, like a violent ocean it ended up landing in, and that's where we have to travel to go get the other, what I would have liked to have been a holocron, but the other Sith Wayfinder, which is where Rey... Faces off against Ray in a mirror match. Uh, it was just a quick moment, very similar to the uh, Luke Skywalker facing off against Darth Vader in the cave on uh, on Dagobah. And just have that facing off against himself. Uh, the difference being of the two scenes uh, was really the lesson that they're learning because uh, Luke is obviously learning a lesson about who he's facing and how easily he can become his own enemy, whereas Rey is dealing with a fear uh, that she already is the enemy and that it's just kind of an inevitability at this time. So yeah, you get that moment, and then you get another lightsaber battle that's already uh, between Rey and Kylo Ren, uh, which is another good one. I will say, from a choreography standpoint, the the best ones are still in the prequels. The uh, epic duel of the fates between uh, Darth Maul and uh, Obi-Wan and Qui-Gon Jinn being one, and then the final lightsaber battle between uh, Anakin and Obi-Wan in episode three is just like, those lightsabers are just moving, man. Those guys made an epic battle. This one was more emotion-filled than athletic, I would say, which is actually more of a testament to the storytelling, which was maybe missing more in the prequels, uh, where they didn't have to be, like, flipping their their lightsabers around so much because of, like, every blow should have just been an attempt at just, like, the death blow, you know, that big, like, ah, and, like, I think that that worked really well, especially that bit when Kylo was finally overcoming Rey and has her down, and it's just that last moment. And then we get to Leia. She reaches out to Ben, and she and he sees her. And that ends up being his downfall when the lightsaber is stabbed through him. He goes down. So does Leia. You watch her pass away in uh, at the Rebel base. So she passes away at the Rebel base. It looks to that... Kylo Ren is mortally wounded, but not exactly because Rey has already determined or has already foreshadowed that she can fix this when she fixes that giant serpent in the uh, in the desert cave uh, that she can heal them. And I can already hear people complaining, "Oh, Jedi, don't do that! Don't do that!" All the video games they can heal, they use healing powers and stuff like that. So, boom! If you want everything else to be canon, then those kind of abilities also canon in my opinion. She heals him. She leaves. She knows what she needs to do next. And that's when Kylo Ren doesn't stand up, but Ben Solo does. And he gets a moment with Han Solo. Yes, Harrison Ford came back to do a brief scene with his boy. Ben is Ben again. And you get a little bit of a mirror from The Force Awakens where he says that the, he knows what he has to do, but he doesn't know if he has the strength to do it. And he gets that beautiful moment with Han who puts his hand to his cheek again. And it was emotional. I'm a dad, so it instantly gets me. 
he throws his lightsaber away. It was a really cool moment. It was a definitive, like, you're not going to get screwed over again, like in uh, The Last Jedi kind of moment, where it's like, oh, you think he turned? Oh, no, he didn't turn. It was just, like, a very brief whatever. Then on the other side, so he's thrown away his lightsaber, and then you cut back to Rey, who's now back on the planet where she had found Luke. She's destroyed her ship, and she is thrown her lightsaber away into the fire almost because it gets intercepted by the force ghost of Luke Skywalker. He's there. I thought they were honestly going to give him more in the movie because of the death of Carrie Fisher. I thought he was going to have to fill in a lot more spaces, but uh, the scene that he got was quite good. And it was basically just him rehashing the culmination of everything that he learned in his trilogy, which was kind of nice. It was kind of that like fatherly passing of the torch that I really, I enjoyed that a lot. And then you got that kind of moment. Uh, it was the Yoda moment again, where she doesn't think she's going to be able to get off the uh, planet now because she destroyed her ship. And then he brings back his X-Wing red five makes a return from the water which he could not lift out of the water the first time. And now he does this time. So great news for all involved. I assumed it was there. I assumed that that actually was going to happen in The Last Jedi, because I didn't think he was going to do the uh, astral projection kind of thing, which I'm kind. I'm still glad they did that, actually, to be honest with you, because I thought it was cool, and it was something that they did do in the Legends versions of things, where actually he goes to the dark side. Well, he doesn't go to the dark side, but he has joined the dark side to take down the dark side from within. And he goes to Biss, the planet I was talking about earlier, and he astral projects himself onto the ship so that Han and Leia think that he's escaping with them. And then he, in fact, says, no, I'm actually still on Biss. And then, whoa. I, I know the radio play version, so there's a lot of sound effects and all that great stuff. So yeah, so we get the moment where we see Red 5 again, and then Ray leads the army, who is not only led by Poe, and not only led by Finn, but also led by Lando Calrissian, who is off on a separate mission now with Chewbacca to try and find some old friends. And Finn and Poe, now both generals, are leading a small armada to the planet where all of this new fleet is. Yeah, and they basically got to take them down because, like, there's so many... It's basically just, like, a bunch of Death Stars, and I know how that drives people nuts, but it's, like, that's how every single movie went. Every single movie had their own version of some kind of planet killer or the big major threat that was in the control of the bad guy, and we just have to kind of get over that. But, yeah, they need to stop these things from going, and they've got a cool way instead of, oh, we have to destroy all of them. It's like, we have to just disable them and we have to do that. And it was an interesting, like different version of the stakes because it was no, there was no stopping them. Once they all went off, it's not like, Oh, they're just about to fire. No, oh, just last second they get them. It's like, no, the second they get up, they're gone. Uh, similar to the, uh, airships in, what was it? The winter soldier when the, like, all those airships were going to go up. It's like, once they're up, they're up and it's, they're online. So they get there. They're facing near impossible odds. Ray has me reached the planet as well. She has confronted the Emperor. He is on like this awesome machine thing. Like it was something that's when you like when you see it in the long shot, it's so much cooler than like because he's been in tight shots the whole time and you're seeing his awesome like dead eyes and all this kind of stuff but then you actually just see him on like a physical machine that is like carrying him around like i'm trying to think there was like a type of puppet that you used to be able to get that was like a, you had, there would be this like long plastic stick and then you had like little triggers that you could like control him while he was walking in the ground it looked very similar to that and it was just such a creepy look and it was so cool I know I'm skipping a lot of things and I'm jumping around and all this kind of stuff, but it is what it is. And I don't want to like, I'm, I'm not here to just like list everything that happened in the movie. I'm just reacting and 
disseminating the information from today. Uh, so we go through all that. Ben Solo makes it to this planet as well. He now has to square off against the Knights of Ren, who I was... I was feeling a little cheated as the movie was going on. You saw the Knights of Ren follow Kylo Ren. You saw the Knights of Ren hunting you like people. You saw them standing around. You saw them capturing people. And I keep going like, who's going to fight the Knights of Ren? Who's going to like, it just kept not happening, kept not happening. I'm like, don't tell me we're going to go another movie without seeing these guys fight. And then Kylo Ren, now Ben Solo comes in lightsaber free of a lightsaber and he's going to square off against all of them by himself while Ray is somewhere else dealing with her own problems. And then this is where we come back to their connection. And she hands off the lightsaber through their connection from one to the other. Luke's lightsaber is in Kylo Ren's hands finally. And he takes on the rest of the Knights of Ren while Ray takes up the lightsaber that she was given by Luke, which was Leia's lightsaber. And you get to actually see a CG-ish version of Leia kicking a CG-ish version of Mart Hamill's ass in a lightsaber duel during their formative training time. Like, So this would have happened almost... This would have had to have happened pretty soon after Return of the Jedi based on the looks that they gave them. Like, he didn't even have kind of like the start of a beard, so it's not like he was aged very much, and they CG'd him, and he looked fantastic. I will argue, though, that Leia's didn't look as good. I would say that the version of Leia in Rogue One was probably better, but I think that had a lot to do with, like, very unnatural lighting, and it was dark with, like, lightsaber glow and all this kind of stuff, but it was a really cool little moment that you just got to see that Leia became every bit the Jedi that Luke was, that they didn't maybe establish enough. I think that's something that made people mad in The Last Jedi because that moment when she pulls herself in because everybody's like, oh, she's like Superman flying. Now she's pulling herself using the Force and she just happens to be reaching out and because, you know, that's how you do it. And I think that had they maybe established a bit more that she had been fully trained before Luke had left, that may, maybe they could have... I don't know, maybe people would reacted differently to that. But now that you get to see her as like a real badass and you get to see she made her own lightsaber and it looked pretty cool. Yeah, it was really interesting. And so now Ray has Leia's lightsaber. Ben has Luke's lightsaber. And they're both taken on their own battles. And in the very end, uh, well, in the very end of this battle, uh, the Emperor discovers or points out the connection that they have, uh, which is born of the Sith connection that Palpatine and Skywalker had and uh, Darth Vader had. So that has now kind of like genetically, I don't know, I don't have a really great way of explaining it, but yeah, it's it, it has created a, like a super bond between the two of them. And the Emperor just basically sucks the life out of them and basically gives himself life back. So his dead eyes go back to those creepy glowing eyes and he gets his power and he starts using that power when he like helps take down the fleet above him, all the uh, rebels. He just basically disables all of their ships all at once and they're all falling to the earth. And Ben is the first one to get back up to try and take on the Emperor, who then basically just tosses him away force style. And that leaves Ray to understand. Basically, the whole point of this movie is that all the Jedi live in her, and the Emperor is talking about how all the Sith live in him, and that he's going to transfer himself like his essence into her when she kills him and all this kind of stuff. And then, so you have this, like, all the Sith versus all the Jedi. It is the final battle between two people. She manages to get both lightsabers back, reflects his lightning powers, which she actually has herself, by the way. We'll get to that another time, I'm sure. Uh, and, yeah, defeats him once for all. A pretty cool effect, too, with the way he kind of, like, 
melted away, for lack of a better word, melted away. Yeah, and it doesn't even end there because after everything goes down, all the uh, rebels have come back, including Wedge Antilles. Did everybody see that? Dennis Lawson does make a return in this movie, a gray a gray-haired pilot who uh, gives a positive review of a shot that uh, Lando does in the Millennium Falcon. I had a little freak-out moment there. There was a lot of them in... En enough people in the theater definitely recognized him, and that was a great little fun moment. I had heard rumors that he might be back. I wish I hadn't, because that would have been a fun little, like, hey, I recognized him immediately, so that would have worked. Uh, and yeah, you've got... So the the whole of... Everybody willing to take on the bad guys here, which I mean, yes, I got the political ramifications of the, of the comment, but uh, just putting it into the context of the movie was still its own fun kind of moment. And then they've got to rescue Finn, and they've got like so many things going on all at once, and it was just a really cool, cool, satisfying kind of like final battle ending then i was really happy with it and then you get the uh celebrations you get the world celebrations you're seeing different planets that we've seen in the past not dissimilar actually from the way that they did it more in the uh re-released version of return of the jedi where you got to see uh a proper coruscant and they threw in uh Naboo and all those other ones. So this one, though, you get Endor. Uh, anybody who didn't notice in the credits, so uh, that was Wicket, was the older one. And Warwick Davis did play him. And Warwick Davis's son actually played the other uh, Ewok, who was Wicket's son, according to the names in the credits. So that was just another interesting little bit. Uh, and what else did we discover in there? Oh, all the voices of the Jedi uh, talking to Rey were all the actual folks. You had Ewan McGregor's voice, Alec Guinness's voice. I know, obviously, he didn't record something new. They found something. Um, Liam Neeson's voice, Hayden Christensen's voice. Uh, Freddie Prinze Jr.'s voice was in there. And yeah, Freddie Prinze actually is uh, Kanan Jarrus in Star Wars Rebels, so he actually made his way into this as well. So like... All the Jedi that they could get their hands on, essentially, were a part of that. And I thought that that was a really cool little moment. It would have been nice to even have some more of these, like, extended canon things to get involved. But it's like, in a movie that was so jam-packed already, it's probably for the best that they didn't. I don't know what else to say about this. We are going to discuss it again when I uh, do our next coming attractions episode with Todd. Uh, we might do a little YouTube something or other with it. Uh, it was just a very, very, very satisfying movie. Uh, I hope I, I speak about it in the coming attractions episode, but there's an inevitability about the people who cling so hard to the original trilogy that they're just, they, again, they were, they're going to see this movie wanting to hate it right off the bat, but not uh, not really willing to give it a chance, and then you just live it. You, yeah, but at the same time, they've convinced themselves. They're like, "Oh yeah, no, this one, this one's gonna do what I want it to do because I'm the fan and I get everything I want. And if I don't get what I want, we officially own Star Wars. That was the thing that came up. Uh, that they're like, "Oh, the ownership should pass to us so we can do it right." And it's like nobody's doing it wrong. It's you guys are just so you you've put something in a vault in your heart, and nothing can look like it, because if it looks like it, then it's, like, false. You know what I mean? I don't know. It's it's philosophical. There's something deep-seated. I'm not a psychiatrist, but those people are destined to not like this movie. I think that anybody who comes into this with a knowledge of Star Wars and a love of... Not, like, every Star Wars movie. Again, nobody loves every Star Wars movie. I don't think that that... Well, I don't think so anyways, or at the very least, they definitely love certain ones way more than other ones. Uh, but the people who accept it with an open heart, I think are going to have a really good time with this movie. I heard a lot of really good reviews. The only bad stuff I really heard was about how overwhelming the movie is uh, in its pace and in its exposition and stuff like that, especially near the beginning. And I do understand that. But again, I think the 
I think the average fan going to see Star Wars Episode Nine is on top of it, and I think that, uh, and I think that that'll be okay. I think it's the much more casual fan who will suffer from that, but I think that the amount of action that's taking place in that time period as well might help with that a lot. Uh, but yeah, if you haven't seen it, go see it, and if you have seen it, go see it again because there's just gonna be stuff that inevitably you missed. There's inevitably stuff that I've missed, um, which I will probably have seen it a second time by the time we talk about this again. But for now, I'm going to leave you with that because this episode ended up being longer than the uh, coming attractions episode. Uh, Just reminders from that episode in case you're listening to this one and not that one thinking that this is just the spoiler version and that's the non-spoiler version. On Christmas Day, we are doing Home Alone. It's going to be a family affair. My wife and daughter will be on the show uh, joining me to do that one. It will be a very safe-for-work version of the episode. It's not going to be like uh, regular episodes when it's me and Todd. So keep an eye out for that. And then the following Friday, so the 27th, we will have another coming attractions episode. We're going to wrap up 2019 and we'll tell you how we're going to start 2020. So very much looking forward to being with you guys for all that. And in the meantime, find us on messcastcommentary.com. Email us, podcast at miscastcommentary.com. Find us on Twitter at miscastpodcast. I'm at JK Finley. Todd's at Miscast Todd. Find us on Instagram at miscastcommentary, and I'm at JK Finley there. Find our number on our website and on Twitter and all that stuff, and you can phone us and you can text us and leave a message, and we will read and or play your message on the air, depending on what you provide for us. Any way you want to reach us, please reach out because we love to hear from you guys when we do. What are your thoughts on Star Wars? I would love to hear about that. Maybe we can include this in the follow-up that we do about this. So what are your thoughts on this latest one? Is it a is it a just ending for this trilogy? Is it a just ending for the nine-episode saga as a whole? Uh, did you like the little parts that get plugged in, like the little Easter eggs and all these kinds of things? Did you dislike them? Uh, Did you like the pace of the movie? They made it a bit more action-y. Did you dislike that because it didn't feel as Star Wars-y to you? Uh, Reach out. I'd love to hear about it. I'd love to hear your opinions. See, I I do want to make sure that people don't think that I don't value even the opinions of the people who don't like these movies. I get where they're coming from. I just don't get why they're wasting their time because they have literally since watching, you know, people who watched these movies probably had like that box set of VHS growing up in the, you know, in the late eighties and stuff like that. When they watch these movies, maybe for the, some of them as kids for the first time, other than the ones who are old enough to go see it in theaters. Uh, and they are, yeah. So, I mean, that is their connection and, I understand that. But again, now once you realize that, I I think if they would have seen it in themselves, that that's where their true connection was, they probably just would have not gone and seen the other Star Wars movies and just been happy. At least maybe go see episode one and go, okay, this is going to be something different. So I'm just going to bow out now. But instead they're like, no, I will go see all of them and you will do exactly what I say. You know. I'm not worried about the toxicity or anything like that. I would like to hear real opinions. I like to hear constructive things. Hey, what would you have changed? What do you wish could have been in the canon that's part of a, the legends and stuff like that? I would love to go over all that with you guys. So by all means, feel free, especially yeah, via email and uh, uh, voicemail and stuff like that. Those are the best ways to do that because then I feel like we're really having a conversation instead of me having to find it somewhere in my Twitter ats, you know what I mean? I think that's it for now. We'll discuss, like I said, this is going to be something that gets discussed more and more. We are very grateful that you listened to two episodes this week, or one or the other. So, for now, I am Joe Finley, and we will see you on Christmas Day. This has been Miscast Commentary, with your hosts, Joe Finley and Todd Murray. Executive producer, Joe Finley. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe to the podcast wherever you listen. 
Visit www.miscastcommentary.com for all news related to the podcast. Miscast Commentary is a Miscast Media Production.